Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, I just want to put this video out there um, just to keep you guys alert, awake in Christ, and uh, let you know to uh, be disciples of Christ and not not uh, followers of men if they veer this way or that way. Um, Ephesians 5, 11, and 12 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Um, I found out a little bit over a year ago that my old pastor is a Freemason. Um, I had suspected some things based on the research I had been doing. Um, you know, if you guys have been watching the Truth series, I kind of drop and allude to a lot of these different things. Um, but of course, one of the things I had been researching at the time was free, Freemasonry. Um, I just happened to come across a video of their online service. You know, I hadn't been to the church in, in many years, Second Baptist Church in Reno, Nevada. Um, but I just started, I started seeing little things. I'm like, no, that's, that's part of masonry is, it's a messianic, uh, thing, whether, um, you know, just certain things. I don't even want to even get all into it, to be honest with you. Um, but I, I had some doubts, so I got, got his number. Um, I hadn't talked to him in a while. Long story short, I asked him, I said, Hey, are you a Freemason? And, um, he paused for a moment. And he said, my daughter just came in. I'm going to have to give you a call back. I, now, mind you, I didn't think he was going to give me a call back. I thought at that point, you know, the, the gig is up. He, he doesn't want to talk about it. He called me back. Two hours later, he did. He called me back. And um, he said, you had some questions. Um, you know, I'm an old man. I don't have anything to hide. Um, I don't want you to be able to say that any preacher ever lied to you. Uh, so I asked my question again. Are you a Freemason? He said, I was an active member. Uh, he said, I'm no longer an active member. I haven't been an active member for 15 years, but he said he was an active member for over 30 years. And um, man, I'll be honest. I, I was a little bit surprised. Not, I mean, I was surprised even though I knew, I figured, but I was just still surprised. I was a little devastated to be honest. Uh, but the next next question I, I asked him was, that, did anyone know? Did anyone at the church know? He said, He said, no. And um, that, that told me everything I really need to know uh, based on him trying to keep it secret in his private personal life, the secret society that he had going on in the background. And, of course, calling himself a reverend, which is a messianic term. They steal God's um, title of being called holy and reverend from Psalm 111, eight, uh, verse 8 and 9. And they try to attribute that to themselves. They call themselves most holy reverend, um, wonderful master, all these things, you get what I'm saying? Uh, it's, these are messianic terms. Once again, I'm not telling you guys to go and study these things. My mind got very paranoid. It got very uh, suspicious and skeptical of everything for, for a good season of life. Um, and it, it was hard to really bounce back out of that. Now, if you already know, you know, you know, uh, put your faith in Christ. Put, remember, keep rooted in Christ as your firm foundation. Um, if you do want to learn about these things, keep your mind rooted in Christ. Don't study the enemy more than you're studying and meditating on the things of God. I say that to you as a warning um, because these things can drive you mad. Uh, there's a scripture that Paul says. He says something like, uh, um, to the wicked, be um, to the things that are like bad. Essentially, I want you to be innocent and to the things that are um, pure and good, um, be wise. Or I forgot how he says it. I want y'all, if y'all remember the, the the verse, put it in the comments. But basically, he's saying to the things that are, you know, of bad, just be innocent, stay astray from those things. But to the things of God, be wise, be built up in those things, know about those things. With all that being said, though, I need to put this out there. I I need to expose as I read. In Ephesians 5, I held on to this for over a year. When he called me back, we had uh, two one-hour conversations. Um, me asking multiple questions, stuff like, you know, how did you feel it okay to make an oath and a vow to, you know, these people the, to, with these rituals and the things they have you do? How did you feel it okay to call men brother that worship other gods that actually hate your God? They hate Jesus and they claim that he's not God. They claim, you know, all types of things about us as Christians. How did you feel it okay to sing the very same songs 
a word of fellowship leaning on the everlasting arms. How did you feel it okay to sing that within the Grand Lodge fellowship of your Mason friends, but you would sing the same song every Sunday when it came to a new member coming into the body of Christ, coming into our congregation. You, you, you confuse the things of God and mix them up with the things of this world and, and the counterfeit things of the devil. And that's the part where I want to expose this, that William C. Webb of Second Baptist Church, who we now call the Pastor Emeritus, um, you know, he's like the overseer of that church, even though he's not no longer the pastor. He is a Freemason. And there's probably multiple people that run with him that are Freemasons. I wouldn't be surprised that the pastor now there is a Freemason. Is he is the dude a good guy? Are they is uh, Pastor Webb a good guy? He, he, he was a, a great member of um, society. He, he really helped people. He, you know, he would check on us uh, if we hadn't been on, you know, to church in a while. He would stop in and pray for people at the hospital. Um, you know, he, he was someone, somebody that was active in the community. He has a street named after him. He had the NAACP coming through our church. He had all these different programs. and But that's what Satan does. Do you understand? And this is why um, I have to put this out there because some of us have relationships and ties to people who are doing deceptive things. And we think, well, because we care about them and we love them or they cared about us that somehow that that makes it OK with what they're doing on having a, 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 a dual life. You get what I'm saying? Having, um, you know, two things going at once. But that shall not be for the that's how the devil operates. He's a minister of um, deception. He comes as an angel of light. And so for these same people that are Freemasons and working in uh, secret societies, that they'll give you flattery, they'll give you gifts, they'll give you praise, they'll do all these things. They'll even tell you about truthful things here and there, of course, naturally. But they know they have other vows, other oaths. And that's why Proverbs tells us that if a king offers you delicacies, put a knife to your throat if you're one given over to delicacies or with an appetite. Because God is trying to tell us don't do anything that's going to have strings attached. Don't make a vow. Don't make a pledge or an oath where you're going to have to fulfill that thing. And it's going to cost something because you have something else you're supposed to be doing. When he says, don't vow anything by heaven or um, or by earth. Don't uh, make any oath. That's something that we're sh we should be taking seriously. When Jesus says, call no man father, for you have one father. Call no man master. For you have one master, even Christ. Um, you know, call no man teacher. For you have one teacher, even Christ. He's simply trying to tell you that when when we make our, our vows to God, when we make this covenant with God in faith, as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the rest have done, we're, we're sold out to him. He says, man can only have one master. He can serve God or he can serve money. The men of this world, maybe they don't say they worship the devil but when you start worshiping anything else in life whether it's another idol god which freemasons do they worship lucifer but once you go up those ranks you'll find out real quickly if you read albert pike's dogmas and um rules and dogmas or whatever that book is called and some of the other ones you know the Sc scottish right uh freemason um information that you can find out there you'll find out real quick they worship lucifer that's why one of the rules is you have to have a God to be a Mason. You have to worship a God. It can be any God. If you walk in a, a Masonic cemetery, which they have, I believe it's Mountain View in Reno, Nevada, you can go there. And if you walk around that, that, that cemetery, there's um, religious symbols on every single tombstone. There's upside down crosses. There's, um, you know, there's regular crosses. There's other stuff going on. You get what I'm saying? Um, but you have to worship a God. But they bring you to lucifer when you're in that cult when you're in that secret society all that being said these men know what they're getting into william c webb the same one that tried to give us the civil rights movement and say he was in that and try to help black people the same people that say they're helping my people 
are the same people pimping my people. So I'm here to tell you that let God be God and let God be true and every man be a liar if they're not walking with Christ and following him in truth and um, spirit. Because at the end of the day, I have nothing to do with the people outside the church. If people are going to be Freemasons outside the church, if these rappers, well, we know they're Freemasons. We know Jay-Z. He does that stuff. We know a lot of these uh, celebrities and these actors and uh, a lot of these um, basketball players and stuff like that. A lot of them are Masons. You get what I'm saying? Firefighters, cops. A lot of these people are Masons. But if they're not Christians, what do they have to do with me? I have nothing. I There's no judgment for them. They're a part of this world. We should pray for them. We should intercede for them. But God said in first Peter that let the uh, judgment of God begin in the household of God. For what do we have to do with outsiders? And so my my I think it should be plain as day if, if you haven't already caught it by now. If someone's claiming to follow Christ, we should uphold that standard as any uh, other standard is upheld in life, whether at a work scenario, whether in college, whether um, whatever you're doing, you know, what I mean, uh, like I always bring up gang culture. Gangs have a very, um, you know, just like the police, the military, they have a very um, straightforward like code of ethics. You get what I'm saying? You don't do this. It's blood in, blood out. These Freemasons, these secret societies, skull and bones, it's blood in and blood out. But with Christ, it's blood in and blood out. Think about it. Right. We, we every time we drink the, the wine or the juice, every time we break the bread, we're proclaiming his blood was shed for us because our blood was filthy. Our blood was contaminated with sin. Our blood is it's we our own blood is on our hands and on our heads for all the sin we've committed against a holy God. So we're proclaiming every time we baptize somebody, every time we proclaim the Lord's um, death and resurrection, when we do communion, that Christ alone has died for our sins and we were put to death with him. But when he raised up, we proclaim just as baptism, when we come out the water, we've been raised up with him now. And so for these people to proclaim that, but they're doing other stuff behind the scenes and proclaiming other things as well. What does that tell you exactly? So I'm here to simply expose that to you, that William C. Webb, the former pastor of Second Baptist Church, who gave me my first Bible, who ministered to my life when I came back to Christ after five years of leaving the church, that same person is walking contrary to, to, to the gospel of Christ, walk, trying to walk two different lives, and that cannot be so. And so for anybody that's doing the same thing with him, that wants to call themselves reverend, or maybe in your city, your town, your, your church, if you're noticing these things, have the boldness to go up to them, have the boldness to talk to them, to pull them aside, have the boldness to talk to people around them. And once again, if, if they won't listen to you, talk to others in the church. If they won't listen to you, leave the church. You get what I'm saying? But me as a minister, me as somebody that's been, you know, seasoned in the word for 13 years now, I'm not, I'm not a babe in Christ anymore. Um, you know, I've been walking this thing out for a while now and I, I feel a, a duty unto you guys to continue to um, live above reproach and not try to, like I said, sugarcoat things simply because I have a relationship with, with him. Like I said, it was devastating when I found out about that. I held on to this for over a year. But the last conversation I had with him, this is the last thing I'll say. He called me and because um, I had asked him to read John 8. I challenged him that to that he doesn't need to try to be liked by everybody because he kept saying, I just do me. I just stay in my lane. And if someone's doing good, because I asked him if, if the pastor at the church now, hypothetically, I'm not saying he is, but I, I said, I, if the pastor was an uh, open or closet at homosexual, would he support him? And he said, yeah, as long as he's preaching the word of God, as long as he's being a good man and uh, doing, doing well, loving people, I would support him. And that really told me everything I needed to know. Um, I asked him about Martin Luther King Jr., you know, and denying the deity of Christ as he did um, and using the Bible as an allegory. I said, how do you feel it OK to, to uh, support and and uh, follow him? You know, you being a Christian, you being a Christ follower, he said, you know, he was helping out um, the, the 
basically the struggle of black people and people's rights. And he was a good man. And so it kept showing me that he his mind was a part of this world. Like so many other people that try to confuse the things of God and the things of this world. But like Jesus said to Peter, Satan, get behind me for you have the, your mind on the things of this world. Now on the mind, <clears throat> your mind, not on the things of God. And so I, I asked him to read John eight when he told the Pharisees, he said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's the gospel we preach. We tell people to repent and believe in Jesus to believe on him, to have faith in him, to walk um, in him and stir up the spirit, to, to be indwelled with the Holy Spirit now, to, to call on his name for salvation, because there is no other way to God. We are all already condemned without Christ. And so I, I politely, you know, boldly, but politely uh, challenged him to read John 8. But when he called me back for the third time, we only spoke for about six or seven minutes the third time. He said, Dr. Wiltz, how are you doing today, Dr. Wiltz? Dr. Wiltz. He said, I'm doing, you know, I I, I try to pay no mind. He said, doing good. I, I, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, doing well. Mighty fine. Um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that no preacher ever lied to you. He kept saying that term, when I, uh, that phrase when I would talk to him. He said, I wanted to make sure I gave you a call back. I couldn't remember. Um, if I told you I was going to give you a call back, I'm an old man. I forget things. But I just wanted to make sure, Dr. Wiltz, I gave you a call back, Dr. Wiltz. And he kept saying, Dr. Dr. Wiltz. And I, I, I stopped. My spirit got real like, all right, he, he's, trying to, he's trying to mock me. He's trying to challenge me. And so I said, I'm not a doctor. And, and he said, oh, I, I know, Dr. Wiltz. I know, I know you're not a doctor. But that, that terms, you know, it's a, um, he, he tried to spin it and say, it's a, um, basically like a good thing. You know what I mean? Oh, you're, you're like a doctor. You're like, you know, the way you study, the way you, he, he was trying to mock me. I could hear it in his tone. And at that point, I didn't have nothing. You know, I asked him, did he read it? Uh, did he take anything from it? He didn't take nothing from it. You were just, oh, it was good. You know, it was good. I didn't, you know, at that point, what's the point of having a conversation anymore? And so, like I said, it was a little over a year ago. I held on to that. I went through the rest of my studies and uh, conversations I had with, you know, the Bible says I have many counselors and um, to wait before you wage war. And don't get it twisted. This is not a war against William C. Webb. You get what I'm saying? There's a thousand um, pastor Freemasons and cheat other people are doing other stuff. They aren't Freemasons. They're cheating on their wives. They're they're um, preaching false gospels, false prophets, all of those things. You get what I'm saying? There's a million pastors out there doing that my war is against the devil and the devil alone and against his ministers of unrighteousness my my war is to save souls and to, to bring as many to christ as possible and as as christ said that the pharisees they go over land and sea to make one disciple but yet they make them twice a child of hell as much as them and so i don't want to bring false converts i don't want to preach a, a, a easy gospel for people that this gospel comes with suffering this gospel comes with persecution uh, that's what matthew 5 tells us this gospel th this grace is going to cost you something um as he's he told paul i'm, I'm going to show him how much he's going to have to suffer for my name and so you know that that level of faith and grace and persecution is different for every single person but all i know is i'm gonna keep running my race whatever it costs me i'm gonna keep running my race and I just want them to let him know and whoever else um, know whether people, if they see that this at that church, the congregants who maybe they don't know nothing about this, because as he said, no one knew. Um, but I'll tell anybody this, that Tramel Wiltz gave his life to Christ. He left the world and Satan and he ain't going back. He living for Christ all the rest of the days of his life. I'm living for Christ talking in third person but i'm living for christ the rest of my days in my life so i'm not going back so i pray that you can have the same testimony and we can keep following christ together so i love you guys god bless you stay strong in the faith keep praying for for others and um you know what i mean praying over your own life i'll talk with you guys soon man god bless you peace